All right, so I know there's a lot of debate about dairy and osteoporosis. And I've made some videos on the, the topic of dairy and why dairy may not be as bad as some people think it is, and some people think it's really good. What I think is really interesting about dairy is that there are actually some components of dairy that are not often talked about. We talk about casein, we talk about A1, A2, we talk about whey, we talk about lactose, but there's another component of dairy that I think is really interesting, and there's some evidence to support the idea of using this particular protein from dairy in order to improve bone health. So stick around, because we're gonna go through some of the early, but decent research on this thing called milk basic protein, potentially where you can get it outside of dairy and what it looks like it can possibly do for bones. So stick around. We'll go through all of this. We got three studies and uh, should be pretty quick. So we'll see you at the end. All right. So like I said, Milk is primarily composed of two main proteins. There's casein, which is actually more common than whey, which you hear a lot more about. But there's casein, which is about 80% of milk, and uh, whey is about 20%. The milk basic proteins are a very small component of this, and it actually contains both lactoferrin and lactoperoxidase. So these two small proteins, which are not very common within milk as a dairy product, but they have been studied to see if they improve bone health independently. And here's what's interesting. So lactoferrin independently interacts with both osteoclasts and osteoblasts. And as you've heard me talk about, we never wanna completely suppress one side of bone metabolism. We need both sides, right? It's a balancing act. So lactoferrin will impact both. Lactoferrin increases both differentiation and activity of osteoblasts, and it inhibits the activity of osteoclasts. So again, this, this pulling back of one side and pushing the other, probably not as strong as a drug, but a little bit. Lactoperoxidase, on the other hand, will down -leg regulate levels of reactive oxygen species in osteoclasts. So if you know how osteoclasts work, they're constantly breaking down bone. And one of the things that can cause further bone breakdown is oxidative stress. And so lactoperoxidase actually works to inhibit some of that oxidative stress. It binds to rank L, and you might have heard me talk about rank ligand when it comes to other drugs. So both of these things, lactoferrin and lactoperoxidase, are having an impact on bone metabolism. So the question is, if you were to take these things as a supplement, would they have an impact on osteoporosis? Well, fortunately, there's some evidence to support that. So the first study we're going to talk about is actually a study from 2004 out of the journal Endocrinology. And, and this is a study that looks at what's called vitro, meaning in the in a, like a, a dish, like a Petri dish, so like in the lab, versus in vivo, which is in life. But then also they looked at animal studies. And so what they looked at is that they were actually culturing osteoblasts from humans, but putting them in Petri dishes and seeing what happened. And then they also looked at a, a male mice um, model to see what the benefit of lactoferrin was. And lactoferrin was shown to have a significant dose-related increase in the process of osteoblast, again, differentiation and uh, reduction in the function of osteoclasts. So you've got both now an in vitro model as well as a, a mouse model, which is substantiating the idea that maybe lactoferrin alone might have an, an impact on osteoporosis. So let's move on then. All right, so the next study we're gonna talk about is now a human study. So this is a, a study from 2001. It's looking at women and milk basic protein or MBP, 40 milligrams per day compared to placebo. So this is a, a double blind placebo controlled trial. So this is cool. Now it's only 33 people, so it's not huge, you know, and it's only six months long. So it's not probably long enough, but it's a start, right? Another issue is that they were measuring the calcaneus rather than say the hip or the spine. Um, and there's some issues probably with that as well, but we can still pull some valuable information out of this. So people tolerated the, both the placebo and the, the quote unquote drug or the intervention. The dropout rate was 0%. There were no side effects of bloating, diarrhea, allergies. There were no safety concerns with MVP. Uh, and they showed a significant increase in bone mineral density. Now, here's where I have a kind of a challenge with this. I looked at this study pretty closely, and they showed that there was, I have the numbers here, a 3.42% increase in bone mineral density in the MVP group which is a lot. And I would be jumping up and down if I thought that that were real. But here's the thing is that they also showed a 2.01 increase in bone mineral density in the placebo group. So we know that unless they're doing something else, there's no reason why a group of women and the average age was, was premenopausal, but there's no reason why a group of women would increase in bone mineral density without some kind of intervention. That's not generally what happens. 
I looked in the, the methods and it didn't look like they had recommended any calcium or vitamin B or any kind of activity or jumping or I mean, anything. So I can't explain why both groups went up so significantly. But we can argue that whatever they were doing, the MBP group did go up more than the placebo group. So compared to placebo, there was a significant increase in bone mineral density. So we'll take it for what it is. They also measured bone turnover markers, not the bone turnover markers I would prefer, but they still measured bone turnover markers and they didn't change between the two groups. So kind of a plus minus, right? So showed a little bit of difference in BMD, kind of questionable results, and not a lot of change in the two groups for the bone biomarkers that were obtained. So, okay. We'll say maybe, but we need more information. So before we go on to talk about the, the last study here, um, if you are getting value out of this content, please do me a favor and just click the subscribe button. It is the easiest thing and the cheapest thing that you can do to help support this channel and to support the growth of this channel and to help other people to see it. Our mission is to give access to this information to as many people as possible. And all you have to do is click that subscribe button and you will help us to uh, achieve that mission. Secondly, if you want more about different, uh, different tricks and things that you can do for osteoporosis and health span in general, look for the link for our free masterclass in the description below. Uh, click that link, get registered for our masterclass. This is an hour long opportunity for you to listen to how we manage osteoporosis, go through all the things that you can do on your own. Some things that are hard to do on your own, but give you guidance on how to potentially do them. Um, and then also have some time for a Q and A. Uh, we find this to be a really valuable experience for a lot of people. Um, I think the last one we did, we had almost 2000 people registered. So uh, lots of people going through this masterclass. If you haven't done it yet, I strongly encourage you to do so. Okay, so let's talk about this last study. So this is a more recent study, 2005. It's also a short one though. It's only six months long, but again, double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. So great. Also small though, around 32 women, but they were 40 plus years in age. And this one is on menopausal women. So specifically in our population of interest, kind of around osteoporosis. So they used the same dose of MBP, so 40 milligrams per day. And they had similar dropout rates. They did have a couple of people drop out in both, though in both the placebo and the, the intervention group. Um, so almost everybody completed it. And then if we look at the results, we can see that there was improvement in bone mineral density in the MBP compared to placebo. Now, what I like about this study is that it shows more like what we would expect to see with a postmenopausal woman or perimenopausal woman likely in this group. So the placebo group did actually lose a little bit of BMD over six months, but the MBP group did actually gain. Now, not a lot. We're talking, um, what was the average? 1.2%. But honestly, 1.2% up after six months for a supplement is pretty good. So especially as a as a, an isolated uh, intervention. So I'll take that as an increase. Now, they also measured biomarkers and they did see some changes in biomarkers from uh, MBP compared to placebo. So again, this is kind of a win for MBP. I think it's interesting to think that this is something that we could potentially utilize and it's enticing to think that there's another supplement that is not often talked about. And I think it gets kind of a bad rap because it does get kind of wrapped into the concept of dairy. You know, there's a lot of people that are afraid of dairy. And if you haven't seen my uh, dairy videos, I strongly encourage you to take a look at that because I think that for people that can tolerate the, the proteins in dairy, specifically casein and whey, that dairy does have some benefit and we shouldn't necessarily be afraid of it. But even if you are lactose intolerant or casein intolerant, I bet you could tolerate these proteins um, and they are available in some over-the-counter products. Uh, there is a product actually similar to what we use in our patients. The company Jero, J-A-R-R-O-W, Jero is a company that has a great form of calcium and they have a product that I'll, I'll put a picture of here that has MBP in it. Now you have to decide with your team if this is right for you. This, this is not a product that we use in our patients because I think it has too much calcium. So even though it has kind of the stuff I like in it, if I were to give my patients this, it, it would be too much calcium. So you have to decide if this is right for you, but I like that this has it in it and there are probably other products out there as well. But I hope you found this helpful and this is something that potentially you can add to your stack. Of course, always check with your team. This is not medical advice. This is just evidence of what I'm finding in the literature. Uh, again, if you are finding value, do me a favor, click that subscribe button. If you haven't read our book yet, you can um, download the book by looking for the, the link in the description below. It's right here. So you can either download the free ebook or you can um, uh, go to Amazon and buy it. It's relatively inexpensive. Um, and it is really a nice jumping off point if you are new to osteoporosis, if you have been 
uh, struggling with your diagnosis and you want more information, this is my evidence-based uh, kind of starting point for people that are looking for a direction or a change in direction uh, based off of what we've seen now working with hundreds of people uh, in the bone health space. So I hope that you enjoy that. Uh, and that's all I have for today. So as always, leave comments below. We love your questions. Uh, I love it when people ask us to do uh, other content videos because there are things that people have researched uh, that we haven't heard of yet. So just let us know the things that you want to see and we'll continue to do these videos for you. I'll see you next time.